Mm-hmm. Let's see. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi, hey. how are you? <laughs> good. Yeah, good to see you through a screen, I guess. <laughs> so. Is it a little bit dark, uh, my screen? Uh, it's a little dark, but... Uh, what happens? Looks good. <laughs> <laughs> It's already quite dark in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think, I think it looks good. What do you it think? looks great. Okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Can I ask you a question? Oh, sure. But, I mean, um, so I, I saw that you are actually organizing this um, archive. Yes. The whole archive. So is it one of the research project or is this yeah, for it's, fun? it's kind of both. It's kind of both a hobby and a research project, honestly. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a, an attempt to build a project within what's being called the digital humanities. Yes, I wrote a couple articles on the manifesto genre, concepts of virtuality, uh, things like this. And uh, I thought I was actually going to write my dissertation on that initially, and then wrote everything I ever wanted to write, really, <laughs> about it. But still thought that the idea it was engaging, and that the, given that some of the writing was really abstract and conceptual, that it would be a good idea to create some kind of interactive or collaborative project that people can engage with. So. Yeah, I'm a literary critic by training, and you know, there's this big uh, push for digital humanities, and I really just want to find a way to uh, learn about digital humanities, especially in relation to literary studies, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and questions related to pedagogy and how technology comes into play. and. Uh, so that's how I come into the picture. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. It seems like there's, there's so much money for digital humanities. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the grants, yeah, <laughs> are available there for yeah. right now, yeah. So um, I've read a couple of the essays that you publish in Chinese, actually. Oh, in media. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in media. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I find your essays, uh, your political writings about the art of Occupy and, you know, the discussion of neoliberalism in Hong Kong very um, academically but personally intriguing and interesting. So as an avenue into your manifesto and philosophical work, I'd like to begin by asking about um, your political writings, because in a number of instances, you talked about locality, identity, the art of occupy, and how does the construction of identity in the spaces and times of dissent figure into a framework for constructing identity in digital spaces? And is the archive a helpful concept when thinking about politics, tactics, and identity? Um, um, yes, I have written a lot on the, on the political questions and um, um, in Hong Kong and China and also in East Asia. Um, and. Um, well, because I spend a lot of time studying phenomenology. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, very important for me to think in terms of time or, or temporal structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you asked the question about identity. But I think identity is an ideological apparatus. Mm -hmm. And we know that it is dangerous. So I rather mm -hmm. wanted to speak, I mean, with Freud, about identification. Mm. So identification is temporal in um, multiple senses, in different senses. It, uh, firstly, it, it needs a past which is, is always already an exteriorized memory. They concretize, for example, in architecture, in different types of, art, of artifacts, or even in body structures, you know, like some of the... Uh, um, anthropologists like uh, André Le, Le Bragoron, mm -hmm. uh, writing on speech and, and gesture. Um, of course, the past will allow us a, a projection into the future. So then we can also talk um, I mean, with, uh, with uh, Jean Paul Sartre, for whom mm -hmm. um, the project defines existence. Right? Mm -hmm. But the projection itself also modifies the past. So it's not only that the past has project to the future, but this projection itself always goes back to, to, to the past in a way that we can imagine a becoming which is not only limited by the past, by memory, but also open to, to a new form of, of, of kind of modification of the projection itself. Mm. Now, um, when lo locality, when it is tired, 
when this is tied to identity, it becomes it easily becomes fascism or nationalism, as you can see, and um, because you are from Hong Kong, you can see already the, the case in Hong Kong. So it is important to reconstruct the question of locality in terms of space and time, rather than place and identity. That is my approach. And archives are, as I said, exteriorized memory in its organized form. Yeah, it's organized. So an archive play an important role in the process of possession. Um, so like, for example, these archives, what the dynastic, the philosopher calls the tertiary mem retentions, mm -hmm. has completed the whole cycle of memory. So, for example, the, our perception, our um, immediate, uh, immediate memory, um, and also the technical, or the, the, the memory uh, resides in technical uh, artificial uh, artifact. No, so, hence, um, archives become what I will call the relays of moderation. And hence, the way we handle archives could lead to a closer or a continuous opening uh, in political terms. <laughs> I think I think that's a good um, it, that's a good sort of theoretical kind of introduction to the, the, the manifesto you've written, the archivist manifesto, in a number of ways. Because you begin that manifesto with a, a provocative claim. I think is that we are archivists because we have to be, and that. To me, I mean, I guess you can maybe correct me if I'm, I'm wrong in this, but it seems to presuppose maybe three conditions, and that's one, that we're uh, forced to be archivists in a certain sense, maybe given certain technolo technological advancements. Uh, two, we're compelled to develop and negotiate archival practices, emerging archival practices. And three, we are subject to competing archival practices. So that question of identification and projection, I think, really... Uh, is is salient here, but I'm wondering. I guess if I have that uh, that presupposition correctly, if you know we're archivists because we have to be because of these conditions, I'm wondering if you can maybe give a little bit more historical context to that, and maybe talk about what technologies in particular um, sort of allowed this to happen. Yeah, I mean, um, like um, since the very beginning, we always archive things that we have. Yeah. <laughs> we don't call ourselves archivists. You have toys, you have books, you have. Mm -hmm. uh, Candies, for example, someone likes to call it candies. <laughs> but I think that we are at the moment of our history where the production of these artificial traces mm. has uh, multiplied in a kind of almost an exponential rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for example, our traces on the social networking websites, and on the clouds, on uh, all kind of applications that you have on a smartphone or right. devices. And I think in the pre-digital age, um, I don't think uh, an individual could leave this amount of chases mm -hmm. uh, unless you are you are you are you are followed by the FBI. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and today, these chases are self-produced in the in the digital environment. And that is also why I insist that in the digital epoch, we need to pay attention to how these data are processed. Um, mm -hmm. To be an archive mean, means that one has to take care of his or her own data, or, or what we call a, a digital object. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not possible at all if all these services are run by the big industrial players. On the other, on the other hand, these industrial players, they are storing and the processing of data with algorithms designed for deriving patterns, mm -hmm. enhancing uh, their predictions, mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of marketing, uh, mostly. And that's also why the, um, you know, the law scholar Antoinette Ouvrard calls the situation now we are having data behaviorism. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it's a problem that we have to, to address today. And I think uh, um, from the perspective of archivists, we can at least tackle this question in both theoretical and practical ways. So that's why I said 
like no we have to be archivists because there's no choice right and i think that you know so you mentioned in the archivist manifesto you mentioned um google you mentioned like facebook things like this and i guess in in reference to those um those kinds of corporations right you make some a distinction between navigable and unnavigable archives and i guess that's a question about how how data is collected how it's um, open uh to be accessed and and things like that so i'm wondering uh first of all what is the difference between unnavigable and navigable archives and second going back to these uh corporations like google and facebook if an archive is navigable is it necessarily more transparent or open right uh uh, yeah, I think a very good question, and, and I think we have to, to put transparency and uh, and, and um, being na uh, navigable as two two questions. Um, yeah. and navigable means that you cannot participate, mm -hmm. or you only have one or two ways of participating. No, I mean I can give you an example. Like you are, we are doing the interview now, and then we are going to, for example, we are going to. Put uh, two hours of video online. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know it's not so long. Mm -hmm. I assume that we are, by the end we have two hours of video. Right. Now, uh, there is only one way of linear reading, right? Mm -hmm. So if you put it on YouTube, uh, then I have to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to watch it from the beginning until the end in order to find that piece of information that, um, that I want. But let's consider another case, if the video itself is well annotated, according to, for, for example, questions, because you ask me a question and I an answer, and if these segments are already annotated, or even a, a certain concept itself, for example, we talk about care, and the, mm. the concept of care is annotated, then the user can navigate and participate in a way that is more active and also more selective. Right. Um, but um, it doesn't mean that when something is more navigable, then it is more transparent. Mm. Things can be transparent without being uh, navigable. On the other hand, being ne uh, navigable like Google it doesn't mean that it has transparency. Right. So that's a um, um, rather. I mean, it's between between being uh, navigable and transparent, there is some something really, really tricky here. And I think, like, for example, uh, in terms of uh, navigability, um, Google seems to be really na uh, uh, navigable, um, and it is a way what I call that the industrial democracy. Mm -hmm. It's a form of democracy that is present in, the, in all kind of this uh, the, uh, the participatory culture. Mm -hmm. Now in almost all the uh, these giant uh, companies, but it has nothing to do with transparency. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you know that question of annotation is really interesting because, as we've sort of built this archive on digital manifestos, you know we've thought about okay how do we make this more interactive, um, and so that you know doing interviews like this is maybe one avenue. But we've also just started discussing the idea of having of, an of annotation. Yep. Um, Right, because that it allows it potentially allow authors to give some kind of annotation, users to annotate um, these manifestos, and that seems to be a really productive and possibly beneficial avenue of you know opening an archive. Um, so I want to go back to uh, your arch uh, archivist manifesto about you talked about attention at the institutional level, where public institutions are forced to or compelled to open their archives as a result of new digital um, strategies. And um, at the same time, these public institutions continue to organize and maintain their archives in a centralized way. And so what are some examples of this tension? And what does this tension mean for the preservation of digital objects? Um, what's, uh, the concept the archive, it's a um, concept of um, for the modern, right? So, if in the modernity, you always need a monument for mm -hmm. your institute. Mm -hmm. So the archive is a kind of like a monument, as Foucault has said. <laughs> right. 
But of course now they, they, uh, that um, organization has some, a lot of pressure to open the archive because of digitization, because of the relation with the public. Um, but the question, I mean, especially with um, bigger institutes, the question is always about the authority right. of the organization itself, which tends to limit the public uh, participation. And this limitation is imposed by the, the knowledge and the code, the code of conduct of the institute itself. So let me give you a concrete example. What happens, like if you consider you are a, a big organization, and what happens if someone leaves some comments with a vulgar language? Mm. Now, you, of course, you have a filter, um, but then you have to, to employ one person to, to, to maintain that these, argue, these comments are well mm -hmm. uh, written. Also, it could be also, also other kind of annotation as well. Right. Now, by, by doing this, it necessarily maintains the institute's power of categorization and annotation. Mm -hmm. Because annotation is of basically, if you look at the concept of annotation from the, the Greek to, to the medieval and now, it's actually, you know, the way of um, uh, interpretation of the ancient writings. You know. And for only for those who has the authority can do that, this kind of annotation. On the other hand, we see also that this power will slowly shift to rural or other standardization organizations, like the organization who promote standards. Um, and these players, they are in the process of standardizing all these vocabularies. And digital objects will still be treated as um, those archive projects in the past centuries, except the way of storage um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is changed. Um, and I think that digital actually could be thought as a new possibility for a new form of democracy or new form of participation. But it will be finally be restricted um, I, this kind of industrial democracy that I have described before. Right. I think that maybe leads back to some of the more conceptual work going on in the Archivist Manifesto, but some of the conceptual work you do elsewhere, particularly in relation, I guess, to Martin Heidegger on the one hand with a kind of temporal structure of care and uh, Gilbert Simondon on a technics of care. Um, so I'm wondering how um, your use, your deployment of the concept of care um, relates maybe a little bit more directly to archival practice and does the concept of care maybe refer back to these questions of the navigable, the unnavigable, and um, open archives? For me, the archive is all about um, taking care of object. Mm -hmm. and, um, and by taking care of objects, we can create context for the users to orient. Right. Um, well, I remember when I was doing some kind of uh, interview or some kind of talks with some uh, archivists who work in the, in, in the National Institute, and one of them from, from Sweden, and uh, he told me something quite interesting, it was really interesting, he told me that, uh, do you, what do you think I have been, I'm doing every day? So, um, uh, so you have to do you know, indexation, you have to to do annotation. And he says, No, I don't do this. <laughs> I said, No, no. I what I have I, I think my job as an archivist is to create context mm -hmm. for um, you know the visitors, even for archivists themselves. Right. So I think that that is something that uh, that creating context in in related to archive has to really be distinguished from just story because now we with uh, cloud computing with uh, google we basically just store our things there mm -hmm. create context ourselves because it's not possible um so i prefer to, to, to use the word orientation than navigation mm, okay uh, since orientation gives you a more a sense of direction 
navigate mm. means that you uh, get you, you get used to it and then you can move uh, in the way mm. that you like. But the orientation is also you have to decide. Okay, I take this direction and another direction. And and this is of course uh, really very significant for Heidegger to move from the analysis of time to the question of place mm -hmm. in a Heidegger at the Zion side. And that is uh, for me the question of orientation. And and for Simon Don, the, 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 the techniques of care is a call to pay attention to to, to technical object and to find in technical object the possibility that can overcome the alienation brought by industrial technologies. Okay. And I think technical ob uh, digital objects, which consist of the, of the archives today, um, are central to, for us to reconfigure these possibilities. Okay. And firstly, the question of time in related to Heidegger, and also the, secondly, the realization of such um, a, an existential critique through uh, the result of the technical details and technical design of a digital object. Right. So I guess uh, maybe I have uh, maybe one final question, I guess, and that is um, why a manifesto? Why did you decide? Why, why the manifesto genre? Why articulate these concerns you know, in that genre? Um, and maybe what was the impetus to, to write a manifesto? Well, but this is a good question, but the answer is probably not so great. <laughs> but because we, 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 um, we, had a, we had a workshop on the question of archives, um, mm -hmm. you know, because the archive is really a, a big subject now mm -hmm. uh, for academic research. Right. Uh, there's a lot of money available to mm -hmm. open up archives, as we have said before. And what struck me, because since um, uh, many years I have been working with archives, but they are all archives of organizations. You know. um, and there's not much attention being paid to what I call individual or personal archives. Right. Because we don't think that, we, don't, we, don't, we, we haven't yet extended this notion of uh, archive to individuals. Mm -hmm. So I say, why for me it's, it seems like it's a, there is a, a political need there to propose this concept of the personal archives. Um, and because of this, so I, have, I decided to call it a manifesto mm -hmm. and then start with the sentence that we have to be, to be archivist. And it's really interesting that at the same time, a few months after, um, I have noticed that, like, for example, the, um, the Library of Congress or the Congress Library, I always confused. Yeah, Library of Congress. Yeah. The Library of Congress. Yeah. They, have, uh, they have released um, uh, a pamphlet, um, which is about developing um, a personal archives. Mm -hmm. You know, they also recognize that, well, it's a, a really important question to, to address now. So, um, so yeah, that is one of the um, the, the major uh, reason that I has, um, that I have written it. And at the same times, uh, I mean, in between and afterwards, I have researched on some of the open source um, tours of personal archive. Um, but so far, according to my knowledge, I couldn't find any mm. personal archives. There are some commercial arch uh, archival uh, softwares that you can use to manage your, dig uh, your digital objects. Right. Um, and in terms of open open source, it's not yet available. Yeah. So I think that um, there is also kind of urgency that uh, those who want to develop archives or archival projects should think about um, the, the, the personal archives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.